Welcome to another interview held by uh, EFSAS. And this time it has been, um, it is my personal and I think professional privilege to be interviewing someone whom I, I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, Professor Parvez Hudbhai. Uh, Professor Hudbhai, welcome. Thank you. Um, I, for South Asian people, uh, Mr. Hudbai doesn't need an introduction, but just for the international audience, uh, Mr. Hudbai is a Pakistani nuclear physicist and also an activist who has served as professor of physics and mathematics at the Foreman Christian College University in Lahore. He has also taught physics at Lahore University of Management Sciences and the Qaeda Azam University in Islamabad. Um, as an activist, he's particularly concerned with promotion of freedom of speech, secularism, scientific temper, and education in Pakistan. Uh, he has been a visiting professor of MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, and the University of Maryland, a recipient of the Baker for uh, the Baker Awards for Electronics and the Abdus Salam Prize for Mathematics, and UNESCO's Kalinga Prize for the Popularization of Science. Um, you have also been included in the list of 100 most in influential global thinkers by foreign policy. Uh, You've been a member of the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament. Um, you, have, you are author of Islam and Science, Religious Orthodoxy and the Battle for Rationality. And of course, you write various for various publications, including the Dawn, New York Times, Express Tribune. And I'm sure I'm missing uh, a lot more <laughs> what you do. Uh, so, um, Professor Hudbai, welcome. And uh, let me start off by asking you uh, a little bit about yourself. You are, of course, a nuclear physicist, you're an academic, you're a scholar, but you're also an activist. And some say sometimes you're more of an activist than a professor. Um, how do you see that yourself? Well, the activists don't uh, accept me as an activist. And the academics here in Pakistan, well, there's not much academics going on, but um, I, I don't know what they think. It's not important anyway. Um, just some small correction to what you said. I've taught most of my life at Qaeda Azam University. So I started teaching in 1973. That's 50 years ago. And I stopped teaching there about a year ago. Um, not because I wanted to stop, but because, well, there was no other choice. In terms of why I am more than an academic, well, I, I don't want to be. I love physics. I love mathematics. If I had another life, I'd do nothing but just study them. There's so much beauty, so much depth, so much complexity that, you know, just a few lifetimes wouldn't be enough. You need to be born again and again. But looking at the world around me, it's a terrible world. It's full of cruelty, of prejudice, of strife, and it's avoidable. It's avoidable if people behave rationally, if they're told what is good and what is bad. And if we learn to analyze the problems of society rationally. And that's what makes me an activist. In particular, what makes me extremely upset is the way that our children here in Pakistan are educated. And for that, and this has been essentially a lifelong mission to try and change that. I haven't been able to do very much, but uh, that's what I want to do. You actually, um... You actually call uh, in a recent column of yours this year, uh, quoting you, and this is very, very interesting that you, that you start off with this because this was one of my first questions to you. Uh, you say, stop force feeding nonsense to our school children. What goes under education is actually religious and propagandistic intro indoctrination. Th those are quite, quite harsh words. Uh, no, I don't think they are harsh. I think they reflect reality. All you have to do is open the school books and you can see what is being taught to our children today. Something like 50 to 60 percent 
is religion based. Since the start of the single national curriculum, which was initiated by Imran Khan, it has now increased yet further, leaving very little time for other pursuits. So, for example, now in Islamabad, I have seen school reports where the library period is scratched out and in that is put Nazara Quran, reading of the Quran. In other school books, in other schools, they have eliminated the teaching of computers. Whenever they learn a subject, whether it is Urdu or English, it's not really an Urdu or an English lesson. It's a lesson about um, great men who were Muslims, or it will be about how um, wonderful the Holy Prophet was. There is hardly anything in these subjects in English, in Urdu, in history, in geography that is unconnected with, with Islam. Now, look, you can teach them a bit of Islam, but you can't make the whole thing about Islam. And furthermore, actually, it's even worse than that. When they teach physics and mathematics, they teach it the way that um, kids in a madrasa would memorize the Quran. So all they learn is how to memorize questions and their answers. The result is that we are ending up as a nation which is very, very stupid. And you might call this harsh, but look, the, the world is harsh when our people, when our youth goes out to the Middle East, goes out to different countries, they then are menial labor. They are nothing but laborers, truck drivers, cooks, whatever, people who build bridges, roads, etc., construction workers. So few of them get decent jobs as, uh, as teachers, as uh, managers, as uh, even qualified as uh, electricians or plumbers. So we have created a level of stupidity in this society that people just don't get jobs. That's why we can't sustain industries. Look at the enormous amount of investment that China made in Pakistan, $60 billion. But can you point out to me where there are factories that are run by Pakistanis or even where Pakistanis are employed by the Chinese to do things? There's scarcely anything. It all comes down to the education system. Yeah, and, and, and you write further, <clears throat> so ironic you say that about Pakistanis who go outside of, of Pakistan, that they are not in very, you know, high skill jobs or management level jobs, because you say, with a handful of exceptions, our universities are trash. Half of fully tenured professors are fit only for driving taxis. So this is something yeah. which, which is, is, is bottom up. When the education system is like that, you'll also have professors who are fit for only driving taxis. It's sad. It doesn't make me happy to say that they're fit only for driving taxis, but that is the truth. In fact, a, quite a few of uh, these university professors, including one who lives on uh, the opposite, opposite side of the road here in my house, hmm. they're property dealers, real estate brokers, they run businesses. They're fully paid as professors, mm -hmm. but uh, they don't have any books in their house. They have no interest in their subjects. How they got their degrees is um, a very interesting matter, but it's not, uh, uh, it's rather easy to know because this is how all students get their degrees these days from um, copying down papers from the internet modifying them a bit and then publishing them in in the scores of journals that have popped up. In fact, some start their own journals, publish and then and, and then the journal ends, but they have a job. This sort of a thing is now not an exception. It's the rule in Pakistan. 
And so if you were to close down the higher education system in Pakistan, I think that a few people would suffer and it would be a loss. I think it's unfortunate that they would. But by and large, it wouldn't even make a difference because they, they don't teach anything of worth in the universities. We have a lot of smart people in this country. And now they have the opportunity of learning from the internet. They can go on and take distance learning courses or they can do this, that, whatever. But in terms of what they learn in the classroom, zilch. Hmm. And, and when you talk about religion in education, again, you, you also wrote this uh, fascinating column where you say in the dawn, I think in April, you say Muslims aren't this way elsewhere. And what I found interesting in this column that you say a lot, but you also leave a lot to the reader's imagination. You 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 know that there, there, there's an there's a very subtle underlying message in this column because I know you know writing about Muslims and Islam in Pakistan is 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 not easy, but you say that the Muslims of Pakistan are different from. All other Muslims, Muslims aren't this way elsewhere. And many, if they wouldn't read your column, would boast about it and find it a compliment. But actually, you're not complimenting them. Uh, that's right. Um, but uh, I think now it's pretty clear that there's a big difference between Pakistan and other Muslim countries. For one thing, no outsider wants to come to Pakistan. You see that. The planes which are arriving here, they have only Pakistanis in them. They're scarcely a foreigner. Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's no tourism, that's except for domestic tourism, and that's a very small amount. You see that, uh, yeah, uh, we would like to have religious tourism, but um, uh, so... We, we would like to have Indians come, Hindus come, but um, can't guarantee anybody's safety over here. We also see that, well, the slightest provocation can get um, massive crowds together, baying for your blood. That happened with the Chinese very recently. So. There is this uh, Chinese supervisor who complained about his workers taking off such a long uh, period between their prayers. They, of course, um, feel they must pray five times a day. But each of those times has to be a very long one. And this Chinese supervisor, he said, hang on, we're paying you to work, not to pray. That was considered blasphemous. They asked for his blood. A few thousand people gathered and they would have torn him to bits, just like uh, they tore a Sri Lankan factory manager. This was in the city of Sialkot. They literally caught him and burnt him to cinders. So that kind of fanaticism, I don't think um, is common in other Muslim countries. In other Muslim countries, you see <coughs> people from, uh, well, so very recently I was in Morocco. And there you see European tourists, you see even tourists from Israel. You couldn't even imagine somebody from Israel ever want, ever visiting Pakistan, except of course as a Mossad agent. <laughs> no, but you, when why is it then, you know, and forgive my ignorance if I'm asking something which, which doesn't make sense, but why is it then that these Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia, who has recently, which has recently opened up, I guess there was a fashion show being held uh, just a while ago in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, you have, you know, you have the UAE, uh, which is, which has a very open society. You have temples over there. there there's no blasphemy law there. Why are, why is it different that these countries, which are seen as the birthplace of Islam, have moved on and Pakistan, which is a country which came out, out of British India, I think the majority of the people have not been Muslim 
for longer than what is it maybe a thousand years so not from the beginning of it why is that then so much so so much difference between a country we just converted to being muslim out of a larger british india than these countries which are the birthplace of islam that's an interesting question i i don't think we converted actually these were muslim majority areas um, before partition and um, of course now it is um, almost um, 98 percent muslim but uh, that, that's besides the point now coming back to your question i think it's because when different peoples live together and they get to know each other then a certain amount of accommodation comes about and ideas start to speak and this is how modernity has spread across the globe. In, in Saudi Arabia, you had a huge uh, population of, uh, of course, South Asians mostly, but also of the Europeans. Ditto for UAE, where I think um, the local population is 15-20%, uh, something like that. The rest are all foreigners. Now, foreigners bring with them ideas, a way of life. You see, therefore, that uh, to accommodate them, various um, shops and um, institutions come up. And then the local population starts seeing that, um, hey, hey, that's a way that uh, people can also live. But let me say that uh, it's not the local populations in Saudi Arabia and UAE which have brought about these changes. It's um, brought down from above. Those are autocratic societies. They um, have, uh, their legitimacy comes from being uh, rulers and kings and princes, where um, in countries you have democracy or some form of it or in pakistan where you have the military that transition has yet to come about now in pakistan i believe that this if this had if, if pakistan had a greater number of foreigners living over here let's say 30 percent instead of uh, 0.01 percent that would have made a substantial difference. But then um, we have uh, grown more and more introverted with time and hence more and more different from other Muslim countries of the world. You can go to practically any other Muslim country. Go to Indonesia, you'll find a fair number of people from outside, from Japan, from China, from Europe, whatever. You won't find them in Pakistan. And you, you just name the military. You also write that many of the large universities are handed over to military, um, retired military officers to run that. Uh, of course, everyone knows there is a big role uh, which the Pakistani military plays in, in, in Pakistan, but also, as you mentioned, in education. So just, just to, to make it clear for the audience, why is it that the Pakistani military is so obsessed with keeping this, keeping religion at the core of its policy in Pakistan? They have to rally people around something and uh, <laughs> religion lends itself very easily to that. So there was a time when uh, the Pakistan army would declare that it was not just the defender of Pakistan's physical borders, but also of its ideological borders, and that it was the army of Islam. And written upon the banners outside army recruiting institutions was uh, Jihad Fi Sabilillah, Jihad in the name, Jihad for God. So it saw itself as uh, the defender of Pakistan and the defender of Islam. 
Now, this actually, at some point, started to backfire. It was okay as long as the Afghan war was going on. But uh, when 9-11 uh, happened and Pakistan had to play an ambiguous role in that, then the question immediately came up. It's uh, the Mujahideen, or rather the Taliban, fighting against the, the Christian invader, America. And so then um, the army, the Pakistan army, finds itself in an ambiguous position. That's when they started to pay the costs. And it uh, was not just the 14th of this 16th of December 2014, when the army public school was attacked in Peshawar and something like 120 kids belonging to the army um, officers were butchered in front of their teachers and then their teachers were butchered and this was done by the Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban. That of course is one particularly gruesome incident but there were hundreds of lesser incidents well, there, some weren't really all that, um, all that much lesser, like that when um, a complete unit of the Pakistan army was captured by the TTP, Tariq Taliban Pakistan, and uh, they were decapitated. And then a video was made of the Taliban playing football with uh, their heads. So that's the price. When, a, when an army masquerades as being the defender of a religion. Because there will always be people who say that we have understood the religion better than you and we are disinterested, disinterested soldiers of Islam. I mean, we are not opportunists like you are. You get these huge privileges in running Pakistan and you are corrupt. And you are therefore the object of our, uh, that's why you are the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now the army doesn't have a convincing way out of this. What can they do? After all, they say that they're defending Islam. Mm -hmm. The Taliban say that they are the soldiers of Islam. So who's right? Yeah, and you also speak about um that this process, you just mentioned the Soviet-Afghan war. Uh, and of course, there was also one um, one period just after that, or just when it was almost ending, which is, of course, um, the Pakistani army or the Pakistani state rallying these militants or these terrorists or these defenders of, of religion around the Kashmir cause as well. Do, do you yeah. think... Yes, it has. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you go ahead. think it has, it has, that has achieved something? You know, the Taliban has, of course, in some way backfired in terms of TTP, and but you also had this Kashmir jihad, which is a, which has been a big thing. Yeah, it's been a big thing since 1987, 88, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the time when uh, things have started to go bad in Kashmir, and that was because of uh, the Indian government's. Uh, opportunism over there, rigging the elections and so forth. And after that, there were uh, three decades of clandestine war that, uh, that Pakistan organized. This was a time when there were plenty of Mujahideen around and uh, it um, did manage to inflict some pain on the Indians. But the real pain was felt by the Kashmiris. In the end, the whole thing crashed the heroes, the Pakistani heroes today have been put in jail by the Pakistani government, Hafiz Saeed being one of them. The whole thing was so totally uh, misdirected. I could use a harsher word. It uh, cost the Kashmiri, the Kashmiris a huge number of lives. So did it, so for the Indians. But uh, what did it achieve? Nothing. Well, you when... say it, it did achieve something. And you say that it achieved 
madrasas that actually became jihad factories. <laughs> yes, that's a very negative achievement. But yes, you can call that an achievement. And so today here in Islamabad, where I'm speaking from, mm -hmm. there are hundreds of madrasas that are illegal that have simply encroached onto very valuable pieces of land. They've encroached onto parks, onto places reserved for public uh, amusement, for hospitals, for simply, you know, you, you need a free space by the road. There you will find a mosque coming up, soon to be followed by a madrasa. And once the walls are up, then nobody dares to to tear it down. So, in fact, um, here in my neighborhood, just in this tiny one um, fourth of a sector of Islamabad, and there are 16 sectors, mm -hmm. I can count more than four illegal madrasas and nobody can touch them. When the civic authorities come by to demolish them, they rally thousands of madrasa students with uh, stones and sticks. They beat them back. So there's absolute lawlessness over here. They, The government cannot do anything. And in fact, if we go back to the Lal Masjid insurrection of 2007, special services commandos of the Pakistan army, each trained at enormous expense, 12 of them were killed. And yet the government, the Pakistani army, I should say, did not dare to lodge a, what is called an FIR against Maulana Abdul Aziz, the man who was at the center of the Lal Masjid operation. He thrives over here. He's uh, two sectors down here in Islamabad. Nobody can touch him. So that's the cost you pay when you have, uh, when, when you fight shadow wars, and um, now Pakistan is not trusted by any country in the world. We were Yeah, I just yeah. Uh, uh, Okay, something happened, huh? Okay. So you're saying we were the epicenter of terror. We acknowledge it now. We simply don't want to talk about it, but we've put all those people who India had named in jail. Do you think Pakistan is still the epicenter of terror? No, I believe it has stopped and very uh, properly so. We should never have gotten into this anyway. What we need is an investigation of those people who had ordered this in the first place, because Thousands of lives were lost on every side, and uh, they should be brought to account. Mm -hmm. What is it that those people sought to achieve? They achieved nothing. So, all, so when you say it is not anymore the epicenter of, of terror, and, and just, you know, hypothesizing on that, what will happen then? Because, you know, Hafiz Sayyid is under house arrest. That's good. But Hafiz Sayyid has a large, large force of people who have been indoctrinated, who have weapons. What will happen then to all the Jashis, all the Lashkars, all these groups who have been cultivated over decades? <laughs> what will happen to them then? I think that it's uh, been going on since um, the last several years. I can't put an exact finger on this, but um, what one needs is active support from the ISI, the military or whatever, to keep these institutions, to keep these Lashkars and Jaishas going. And that I have no evidence that um, they are continuing to do that. So I would say, think I from from whatever 
I see, or rather the absence of what I see, that uh, Pakistan has pretty much given up on the idea of um, having a shadow war. Mm -hmm. And now it's uh, just hoping that someday things will somehow work out. Given the fact that Pakistan is in terrible economic distress, and uh, now um, pursuing that kind of covert war is no longer an option. All that um, India would need to do is uh, provide evidence and um, additional difficulties would arise for Pakistan. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, we've stopped making a noise about Kashmir. Every 5th of February, there's a national holiday mm. and, and people are told to come out into the streets. And it, uh, of course, everybody loves a holiday. And so all schools, colleges are closed. Shops are, most shops are closed, which means that it harms the economy of Pakistan. And of course, uh, that's something that India loves. But it doesn't really bring the liberation of Kashmir even an inch closer. So I'm, I'm quite mystified by why uh, they insist on harming themselves. Mm, there are also superficial um, things like, uh, for example, they renamed Kashmir Highway, which just passes in front of my house over here, as Srinagar Highway. And they've changed boards over there showing you how far it is to Sirinagar and to Leh. I don't know, maybe they'll write uh, Delhi also. But these are flights of the imagination. And, and they seem to be living in a parallel universe. But you say a very interesting thing. You say, you said afterwards, you say that um, you think or you don't have any evidence that this terror policy is being continued. And then you came about talking about the economy. And I got the impression that you're saying that this policy might have stopped or is, is less than it was before because of the economic restraints on Pakistan. Does that mean that ideologically there hasn't been a change of heart? So it's a compulsion because of economic reasons? Or has it really come about a thinking that this is not the right way? Oh, I think um, if um, the if the Pakistani establishment could find funding, it would continue as it did earlier. I don't think that there's a change of heart. I don't think that any kind of a serious lesson has been learned. I don't think there's introspection. They, um, however, don't have an option. The fact is that Pakistan is on the on the cusp of a it's of an economic breakdown. In fact, I would say the economic breakdown has already occurred with a fifty percent inflation of food prices. So, what you would have bought a year ago with a certain number of rupees would be half of what you would be able to buy today with the same number of rupees. If you see how badly this has affected the poor in this country, it's heartbreaking. The military, of course, would like to continue, but now it doesn't have the option. It must recalibrate. And so it is now, I think, putting it in the cold storage. Okay, so again, let just to phrase myself, you say that Pakistan's support for terrorism has only declined because it cannot economically afford it anymore. It is not as if they have, the army has thought about what you have written in your various writings, that this is not the way. So that would mean that once they have the money and when things get better, we are again at square one. Well, look, uh, they don't think of this as terrorism. They think of this as um, trying to get rid of a usurper, that is to say the Indians. And so this means that there has been no change of basic thinking. Um, however, let's not look for basic changes. I mean, basic positions in India and Pakistan 
are already pretty hard. And mm -hmm. uh, we cannot expect that any amount of argumentation will ever change that. What we can expect is that given how material, given the material situation, that there will be a softening on the Pakistani side and will result in a corresponding softening on the Indian side. Mm -hmm. So if you were to ask me what's um, a desirable outcome, I'd say soften the borders in, soften the line of control in particular, let divided families reunite, let there be trade, let uh, people be able to go from one side to the other side. And of course, with the proper documentation. And that doesn't mean that you're allowing terrorists to go from Pakistan into India or the Pakistani side of Kashmir into the Indian side of Kashmir. It's not saying that at all. After all, um, you know, terrorists don't apply for visas. They, they go anyway. So I think that's what ultimately makes sense. Is it going to make sense for the Pakistan army? Not right away, maybe, but um, in time it will. You have talked about India, you've talked about Pakistan, and you just touched on the um, the dragon in the region, Chinese, um, which you've also uh, written quite extensively about. Um, and there's one particular sentence which I found very interesting, and if you could just elaborate that a bit more. You say China is probably guilty of short selling us. What do you mean by that? 30 billion dollars are owed by Pakistan. Um, th Pakistan owes 30 billion dollars to China. And that's a good proportion of our external debt. Now, in return, um, Pakistan has got roads and power plants, but um, that has not uh, resulted in any increase of um, its productive capability. There are no factories that have been set up. In fact, what one sees is that because of the free trade arrangement with uh, China, which was which was um, a mandatory condition that the Chinese had laid down, that free trade arrangement has um, wiped out local industry in Pakistan. So you had uh, people making uh, uh, cables and uh, fiber optics and uh, fans and stuff like that, small stuff. But all those little industries have um, essentially packed up because there's no tariff on the Chinese goods that are coming in. Furthermore, you see that a lot of the Chinese in, uh, investment was um, not really for Pakistan's um, economic advancement, but rather for achieving China's strategic objectives. And I refer over here specifically to the port of Gwadar. I was there recently and uh, the Chinese have built a harbor, but that harbor is is visited by a ship every other day. Whereas uh, if you look at Karachi Harbor, it's jam packed with ships. There are ships waiting far out into the sea, awaiting their, their turn to come to port. Gwadar is empty. And yet there's a road connecting that all the way to China, to the Hujrab Pass and beyond. Now that has a clear military significance. I don't see any economic significance, nothing as yet. And even the economic significance, even if there is any, there's again an interesting thing I read which you which you wrote is that talking about Gwadar and then the CPEC in particular, you say the CPEC was built around a fatally flawed premise. It presumed that infrastructure, roads, bridges, and electricity alone will create growth and jobs. But the crucial yes, is it, it, human capital. Sorry. The Sorry. Uh, is human capital. 
which the CPEC or this Chinese Pakistan friendship did not invest in. What I meant there was that sure, you need roads and electricity and, and um, you know, all the infrastructure, bridges and bypasses and uh, ports and all that. But what you need most of all is, uh, first of all, the human capital and then a plan to use that human capital in a very definite way. So simply having electricity is not good, is not good enough. Simply getting water into a certain area is not good enough. What you need to do is have a plan to build a factory over there. But that factory has to be built in order to service some definite demand. Now, where is the planning for that? All there were only words. There were no blueprints. And so the Chinese did the, did the easiest possible thing. They brought in an army of workers, of engineers and technicians. The only Pakistanis that they hired was for manual labor. They built power plants here, electricity distribution systems there, and mining and so forth. But uh, they did not uh, actually want to create industries. And even if they wanted to, Pakistan could not offer them the kind of skills that are necessary to run a modern economy, to run a modern factory. We ideally should have prepared a whole bunch of uh, very focused technologists, those who are capable of very particular tasks. Mm -hmm. And there's only a tiny fraction of that available. And so therefore, this opportunity has been lost. I don't blame China as, a, as much as I blame Pakistan for this. We could have done a lot better. And you, 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 you still think that, because many people have said this also about Sri Lanka and also about countries in Africa, that the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which CPAC is a part of, is inherently um, has more of a military, uh, you know, purpose than it has economic purpose for the host countries. Yes, um, I think in Pakistan's case, uh, you see the great. Um, uh, cooperation between the Pakistani militaries, the Air Force, the Navy, not so much the Army, but I'd say the uh, the, the Air Force. Uh, and, and of course, with the Army in the sense that now Chinese satellites um, are, are ears. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you had, already, I, you had already warned us about the internet connection there, of course. It's, it was not the internet, it was the electricity which went off. <laughs> it's, um, load shedding. Uh... Load shedding. Load shedding, actually what happened was um, there's not enough sun. I'm actually running on solar power. Okay. But I also have to have the air conditioner on and it crashed. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're, we're, we're back. Yeah, you were... Um... Of course, we, I've, I've taken a lot of your time, but we, we'll just, you know, a, a few more questions. You were talking about the, um, especially in Pakistan, the military strategic nature of the investment of uh, Chinese. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear that um, there's very close cooperation between the Chinese and the Pakistani militaries, their air forces, their armies and their navies uh, in particular. You see how the how the Chinese are the ears and eyes of Pakistan. Their military satellites give in real time data to to Pakistan, and uh, without that, Pakistan would be completely blinded. It wouldn't know how to um, anticipate uh, an Indian attack. It um, so you remember that missile which strayed into Pakistani territory by mistake. Well, how did Pakistan? and find out it's obviously through 
Chinese satellites. It's they which give us real-time data. And of course, the GF-17 project and uh, so much more. The Chinese uh, frigates that are being given, to, that are being sold to Pakistan, etc. But even more, I think it's the port of Gwadar, which we've already discussed and which um, doesn't seem to have much economic significance, but that's, that gives Chinese and the Chinese an outreach into the Persian Gulf, into the Arabian Sea. But aren't you, as, as a concerned Pakistani, aren't you, uh, I would say, uh, afraid or, or, or maybe, you know, thinking about what could happen then with Pakistan being an economic dire situation, with being very much dependent for its military and strategic input from the Chinese, with an at least an perceived enemy uh, of uh, like India next to it, with uh, Afghanistan on the other side, which is very uh, not very stable. Doesn't it have then, you know, the danger of becoming almost a vassal state of, of, of China at some point of time? Or how do you get out of this? To date, the Chinese haven't made any um, particular demands on, on Pakistan that are overt. Mm. Um, I think Pakistan very willingly gave Gwadar to the Chinese. It was, um, when I say Pakistan, I mean the Pakistani military. It's not that the people of Gwadar like it. In fact, they deeply resent it because um, it so interferes with their fishing and their way of life and uh, the construction which um, has uh, left them completely sidelined. So, but that's another issue. The Chinese so far have... Uh, been very discreet in their dealings with Pakistan, and that's what uh, the Pakistani establishment loves. Unlike uh, the United States, which um, insisted that uh, Pakistan fight against terrorism, against the Taliban, Al Qaeda, and so forth, the Chinese have no demand to make, and in and in turn, Pakistan doesn't raise its voice for the Uyghur Muslims. It knows. Everyone knows uh, what's happening over there, but um, we're not talking about it. So are, will we become a vassal state? I think that will is perhaps too strong a word. Um, after all, there's been much more direct control of the United States on Pakistan than we've seen of uh, the China, or we've seen of China exercising uh, its control elsewhere. Of course, Hong Kong is another matter that was a part of China at one point. So, uh, vassal state, no, but uh, it seriously compromises Pakistan's independence. Pakistan's? Its independence. Independence, okay. So, the Americans were... <sighs> basically much more westernized and very direct in their dealings and as, you know, as a superpower. Uh, would it be good to say the Chinese understand the culture and the ethos of the Pakistani military establishment better and deal with it in a different way? Well, I'd say that the Chinese are no way as aggressive as uh, the US or the, or, or the European powers were in the days of imperialism. I mean, it's... Uh, if, if one compares the two, there's no comparison. But uh, certainly, China strongly pursues its national interests and they become aggressive where they see their core interests as being at stake, like in Taiwan. That's a different thing altogether. In relation to Pakistan, it uh, sees it as um, a state that will support it in international forums that's... Uh, Counterweight to India, it's a but they're not they're not going to give Pakistan uh, an open lease or a um, they, or, or a blank check. Mm. That they are very clear about, and so they will not bail out Pakistan in this economic crisis. Yeah, they'll give a billion or two, three billion maybe dollars. But that scarcely counts. And then, like you said, 
it wouldn't make Pakistan a vassal state of China, but it does seriously compromise or could compromise its independence. Not good, has, I'd say. It has compromised. Okay. Um, that's interesting, especially with also the Chinese and Indian geopolitical tensions going on over their line of actual control. Um, and of course, as you know, the Chinese have been for a while supportive of or, or vetoed the listing of many uh, Jammu and Kashmir oriented terrorist groups uh, like Masood Azhar and I guess his brother-in-law has been vetoed recently. So at international platforms, what you're saying is, is quite correct that at international platforms, it the Chinese do act or try to act for the Pakistan, for Pakistan as a counterweight to the Indians. Well, and vice versa, Pakistan will support China on every cause. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Professor uh, Hudbai, let's come to today. Um, you have, again, like I said, the, when, I, when I requested you for, the, for this interview, um, about the topic, and I said it would basically revolve around uh, your your latest uh, column uh, where you talk about, I think a month ago, don't blame Imran Khan alone in the dawn. But before that, of course, you've also talked about why uh, uh, bash the elite. Uh, so if we come to today's situation in Pakistan, especially the political situation, and just quoting you a little bit, one prime minister was long ago was hanged. A few here and there were exiled. The current prime minister's brother is still exiled in London. He has been a three-time prime minister. And then you have Imran Khan. Can you explain Imran Khan? Because he's he, he tends to be, people see him a little bit different than the traditional politicians Pakistan have had. Uh, he has, of course, he was, according to many analysts, he was produced as by the army, and then he went berserk against the army. Where where do we stand now in in terms of this 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 politics there? And why is Imran Khan not alone to blame? Of course. <laughs> well, um, Imran Khan rose to his heights because of the army. And now he has been forced to descend those heights again because of the army. The army saw him as um, somebody who shared values, which is uh, uh, being highly uh, pro-Islam, pro-Taliban, anti-India. And uh, they saw that uh, he could develop a popular following. So they launched him. And we know that um, the ISI chiefs were instrumental in this, General Shuja Pasha in particular, and of course the, uh, well, others, but um, they engineered his rise to power. They um, didn't like Nawaz Sharif because he had uh, come out against General Musharraf and seemed to have a mind of his own and didn't sh quite share all the values that the army would wish uh, they had in common. So on uh, essentially personal grounds, they uh, preferred Imran Khan. And uh, so they brought him up. We saw clear evidence of that. The fact that those uh, massive demonstrations, dharnas were organized in Islamabad and could shut the city down for days, weeks, months on end. That simply could not have happened without the army being fully there. And of course, General Bajwa has, after retirement has, uh, and even just before he was retiring, admitted that uh, the army had brought him on and said this was a mistake and that the army shouldn't be in politics. But then of course, um, 
Imran Khan got totally out of control. He uh, got so embittered that he started biting the hand that had once fed him. And so after a little bit of pain, the army reacted. And now it's reacted so hard that I don't think Imran Khan has a chance of coming back to politics again. The fact that his party has deserted him, I mean, all the major people who were by his side on all, in all those public meetings, not one of them is to be found, except for Shah Mahmood Qureshi, who, uh, who knows what kind of a game he is playing. But I think um, Imran Khan, because of his hubris, humor, because of his hubris, his arrogance really uh, shot himself in the foot. Okay, now, why is Imran Khan uh, not so very different from Nawaz Sharif and Shahbaz Sharif? I'll say that they're all part of the thieving elite of Pakistan. They have all stolen. They're all greedy for power. Okay, you can say all politicians want power, but neither of them has a vision for Pakistan that can conceivably get it out of the mess that it presently is in. They have, they're still committed to eternal hostility with India. They still think that having Islam in greater doses is the way out for Pakistan. And that's reflected actually in, in what kids are being taught today. The single national curriculum, which we discussed earlier, was started by Imran Khan. It equivalenced the madrasas to schools, meaning that our schools have become madrasas. Now, that was only on paper earlier. It's been put into practice by the present government of Shahbaz Sharif. And of course, they won't backpedal on that. If you look at how wealth is distributed in the country, there was no difference at all between how Imran Khan functioned and how the present government functions, or in fact, the government before Imran Khan. So the elite consensus hasn't broken down. It's just that the pot has gotten so small. It's just that Pakistan is so saddled with debt, with debt, debt. Uh, that now things can't continue as earlier. Now something has to give. How it will give is anybody's guess. It could be just a steady decline. It could be greater and greater poverty that people quietly accept, or it could result in an explosion, or it could result in a in the TTP coming back into the mainstream and uh, and killing Pakistanis left and right and getting a fraction of the establishment to support it. So many options, many possibilities exist. And, and how do you see this? There's a lot of talk about this 9th of May, 9th of May as if like, you know, what happened on the 9th of May. And you know, many people ask, and, and I, I I would like you to answer that, is that you, of course, say the, the, the army, Pakistani military establishment, propped Imran Khan, then they didn't want him. So it, it politically engineers things in the country. It has always done that. How is it that the 9th of May was so violent that places of the Pakistani army were attacked that, uh, you know, symbols of its uh, winning feats uh, were destroyed. How was this all allowed then? Was this allowed by the army? Was there a plan behind it or was it just an eruption? It was an eruption. It was not, I think, some deep-rooted conspiracy. It's just that people, that Imran Khan made people very angry. He said, um, there's a conspiracy to remove me, to kill me, and uh, now you got to show your strength. And for he had been saying a lot of things against the army, 
but uh, this is the first time that uh, he, he said go for them go for them and they did so i think this was just a spontaneous outburst it um, it showed that uh, people that uh, his supporters were extremely angry because after all he does um, exercise a charismatic influence on them but uh, the arm now, now if we look at the totality of it it uh, involves a handful of inf incidents no more than that but the army said okay after an initial period of doing some stock taking first of all they asked how is it possible that so much destruction was allowed and um, people who had, been, who had been assigned to protect those places had been inactive. Why didn't they do something to stop the vandalism? So the first suspicion fell on insiders in the army who um, would be sympathetic to Imran Khan and surely there are a lot of them and therefore there's all this talk of the army splitting and of a mutiny within. Now, a mutiny is something that no army will ever tolerate. And that, I think, convinced General Asim Munir that he has to now just go for them. And so he smashed them. That party, the PTI, has been smashed. So this became May of 9th, May 9th became Pakistan's 9-11. All you heard on television was uh, of the conspiracy to destroy the one force that will save Pakistan, and that's the Pakistan Army and the iconic, um, the the uh, the icon of that was the burning of the core commander's house, Jinnah house, and so it went on and on, and so that justified the crackdown. Okay, and then two questions together one is do you think that the 9th of may what happened there the vandalism and the you know what you say the 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 people or the supporters of imran khan going for the army one do you think it has it has of course not destroyed the army it has not taken away their political role do you think it has taken away a bit of the sheen of the army and what will yeah, well, that's one. And so has it taken a bit away of the shining, the sheen of the army? And second, what will happen to Imran Khan now? Will he go to jail? Some say he will be imprisoned. Some say he might even be hanged. He might be disqualified. How do you view that? Well, it has taken away the sheen. But remember that Sheen was also taken away in 2011 after Osama bin Laden was found in Abdabad just next to the military academy over there. But the Sheen came back. And so I think this is a temporary. Yes, you're right that uh, there is now a, a considerable fraction of the population that is not enamored with the army that actually um, finds that, that actually dislikes it enormously but will they organize themselves to fight the army no mm, this is not going to be uh, sudan where what you see over there is the army fractured from inside to to fight to to seriously dent the pakistani military establishment it has to break from within and that is something that the army high command has now moved very firmly against in terms of imran khan and what will happen to him it would be utterly stupid to send him to to hang him of course that would be <laughs> utterly madness it would uh, it, and it's also totally unnecessary. What they think they will be able to get by with is uh, disqualifying him. And certainly there's a lot that can be used to disqualify him. His uh, actions while in government have been certainly 
um, by the law of Pakistan, um, clear violations, you could even say criminal, and to disqualify him is, I'd say, the, the easiest way of preventing his victory. If they don't disqualify him, if they let him run, he might even win. So you don't even with the PT. You don't even with the PTI being in the state of disarray, it is. And you don't see Imran Khan going to jail. I don't think so, because going to jail means that you make a hero out of someone. That's uh, traditionally in in the subcontinent. Whoever goes to jail comes out, becomes a hero, hmm. and uh, they can't risk it. Not with a person like Imran Khan. Okay. And you said neither of them, when you talked about Imran Khan, Shabazz Sharif, Nawaz Sharif, you said that neither of them have a clear vision for Pakistan. Uh, both of them are greedy, greedy for power, greedy for money. There's one big party uh, which you didn't mention. Um, and they also have been in power for a long time and they have a young person who is who is leading it now that's the people's party and so what do you think about them are they the same do they have something else something different do you see some you know some people do say that bilawal bhutto is young but then he makes a lot of gaffes as well but then he also says some good things so how do you view them are they in the same boat well i'd say we've seen pretty much what the people's party has done in Sindh, its, uh, its governance over there has been absolutely awful. If one goes even to its constituencies, one sees that it's, uh, a, it has not been able to um, address the needs of those communities over there. Furthermore, the People's Party is a Sindh-based party. If it had been Punjab-based, well, one could have uh, been uh, more uh, optimistic. Well, one could have said that it's more likely to exercise influence in the rest of Pakistan, but it's now a local party. It has little support in Punjab or for that matter in KPK. And so, well, who knows the way that politics will go if it ever again comes to power it'll be only by the slimmest of majorities and it'll be only with a hung parliament and so uh i, I don't see um the people's party re-emerging bilawal bhutto is um i don't think he's serious he can be considered a serious candidate for the prime minister of pakistan is a, a young chap, uh, grew up outside the country, is disconnected with the people, can barely speak Urdu. When he speaks, it's uh, uh, quite amusing. I don't see his acceptance in KPK, in Punjab, in Balochistan, and uh, even in Sindh. The People's Party is there just because uh, of the lack of an alternative. Um, Professor Hudbai, we, 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 I've, I've taken a lot of your time, so I'm coming to the end of, 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 the, of the interview. You have, of course, you know, you've explained why Pakistan is what it is, what is happening now. And, you know, the, the line which I've been hearing uh, in this interview, but also in your writing, there's a lot of skepticism you know where do you as a pakistani because you've talked about the politicians the ttp the army the education system where as a pakistani do you see hope because you also discussed pakistan's you know independence the economic status that do you see any hope why is that relevant <laughs> My question is, um, look, uh, things will be as they will be. 
This is a country of 250 million. Those people are not going to go away. In fact, the numbers are going to increase and increase far too rapidly. There will always be people of good sense in this country, of high intelligence. And all one can do is hope that, uh, that they will be in positions of power things look dark for pakistan presently i don't know how we're going to manage the economic collapse which is impending but perhaps this is the tough medicine that we need in order to break out of the delusions that we had earlier and those delusions we all know about pakistan claiming that it would be the leader of the Muslim world, Pakistan saying that its nuclear weapons had made it so impregnable that no way could it ever be imperiled either by countries outside or by factors within. And I say this because a lot of people even today believe that Pakistan is so important a country that the Western countries will never allow it to collapse, etc. So the short answer to your question is, yes, there is hope, but we'll have to work for it. We'll have to work very hard, harder than most people in most other countries. And that will start, as you have always believed, from bottom up, the education system. Yes. Let us not uh, minimize the ability of people's intelligence to see through falsehood. That is, I think, a, a very hopeful, while you were not willing to answer that <laughs> question, that's a very hopeful uh, sen sentence to end on. Uh, let us not minimize the people's ability to look through falsehoods. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Hudbai. I hope uh, this is not the last time we are speaking. You you touched upon um, uh, Kashmir and you also touched upon uh, Indo-Pak relations in China. Um, I hope we can we can speak again, maybe even in person, um, uh, and maybe much more on indeed your uh, ideas, which you had also for 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 peace, for peace among the countries when you talked about. The softening of the borders, the softening of the LOC, the the going across that is maybe also a, a topic which we could further discuss uh, next time. Good, thank you very much. Thank you, thank and you. See you much. later.